morning and welcome to the work on the role of data and AI at the workplace. My name is Tobias Müllensiefen. I work for the European Commission in the Future of Work team in DG Employment and I'm very honored to be able to moderate this workshop today. I would ask my fellow panelists to join me on the stage. So in, in the last 24 hours, we've heard a lot about the changes that new technologies such as AI will bring to the workplace. And AI needs data. And deploying AI at the workplace will therefore go along with in unprecedented levels of data collection and processing. And in this workshop, we want to focus on the connection between data, AI, and working conditions. We've also heard that technology is neutral and it depends on what you make of it. And if it's used in the wrong way, it can lead to massive surveillance, uh, impinging on the privacy rights, lack of transparency, leading to an increase of the imbalance of power. On the positive side, I think it can, bring, it can improve health and safety at the workplace, fairer evaluation of performance, of, um, but also move to more rewarding tasks. We want to discuss this, these opportunities and challenges in this panel and what companies, trade unions, NGOs, governments can do to minimize the risks and to bring out the more positive elements. And whether we need new tools, rules, approaches or whether what we have in place, the guardrails, are enough. With us to discuss all this are our four excellent panelists, uh, which I will present now. First, on my left, um, Barbara Thiel. She was Commissioner for Data Protection in the German state of Lower Saxony for eight years until this summer. She's a lawyer by education. She had previously worked in the Ministry of Interior of Lower Saxony and also had positions at, in local government. And she's also a lecturer at the University of Göttingen and author of publications on data protection law. Welcome. We're very happy that you're here and you made it despite the train journey and everything was on time. <laughs> next, next to Barbara is, is John Lester, Vice President in IBM for HR Technology Data and AI. He has been with IBM for 18 years, um, first as a consultant on technology and human resources. And his current responsibilities include digital HR strategy, development of cloud, AI, automation and blockchain technologies for HR. We're very happy to have you. Next to John is James Farrar, founder and director of the Worker Info Exchange, an NGO dedicated to helping platform workers access their personal data at work and to challenge unfair algorithmic management. Um, James has previously had a career in technology. He's been an Uber driver himself, and he is now helping gig workers claim their rights in strategic litigation in the UK, but also in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And last but not least, um, we have Adrian Todoli Signes, Professor of Labour Law at the uh, University of Valencia in Spain, also Chair of Digital Transformation at this university. He's been the author of uh, academic publications, including on algorithmic management, expert to the ILO Commission on Platform Work, and he's also been appointed by the Spanish Labour Minister on the Expert Commission for Work and Algorithms. Very welcome to you as well. And finally, on, uh, at the far end, my colleague Jasmin Gegenwart, who has helped uh, to set up this workshop, uh, has put a lot of work into this, and who will help with moderating the Slido questions in the second part of, of this um, workshop. So before we start the debate, we want to hear a bit from you, from the audience, about what is your feeling of the risks and opportunities that AI increased um, uh, and increased data processing brings. So for that, we have a Slido um, survey. We will do it in two rounds. You know the game by now. Please take out your phones. Here's the QR code that you can scan and we'll ask you in two questions. The first question is, what in one or two words is your impression what, when you think about the opportunities that data and AI can bring to the workplace? So if you can just give us your ideas in one or two words, what comes to your mind when you think of data and AI at the workplace? What are the good things that this can bring? And we hope that once you put in 
some of your ideas, we will, um, a work cloud should appear on this. So again, if you could tell us in one word about the opportunities of data and AI at the workplace. I see people are taking out their phones. Can, can we see this in real time? Um, there's no poll. Okay, we'll try again. Still no poll? No? Okay. We'll wait for a few seconds of after. Does it work now? No? Okay. Well, then I think we'll just skip this part and get, go right to um, the discussion and we'll have the opportunity for you to ask at least questions on Slido, so we will activate that now, so that in the second part of the, um, of the workshop um, we can take your questions. So my first question would go to Barbara. In, in your term as, as Data Protection Commissioner of Lower Saxony, you, you launched an investigation for violation of data protection rules against Amazon at a warehouse in, in, in northern Germany. And this concerned um, the collection of data via handheld devices, which were used for productivity and, and also the workflows, but they were also used for work performance. Can you give us a bit of context and tell us why you did launch this case, please? Okay, yes. First of all... I think um, you need to I get to your mic. First of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, very honored that I can be in Brussels and uh, talk a little bit about my job in Lower Saxony. Um, due to the employee data collection practiced at Amazon, my previous authority um, had initiated a data protection control procedure. On the basis of the facts established, the authority issued a prohibition order against Amazon. In this order, the authority prohibited Amazon from collecting current and minute-by-minute -minute quantity and quality data on its employees and from using this data to create quantity and quality performance profiles as well as for feedback discussions and process analysis. What had we find out? Amazon employs between 1,700 and 2,200 people in a fulfillment center at its uh, Winsen site in Lower Saxony. On average, around 220,000 um, 220, parcels a day, which are subject to a delivery date guarantee, are dispatched. This corresponds to the equivalent of sending 153 parcels per minute. On average, Amazon has around four hours between receipt of the order and the time at which the parcel must be handed over to the carrier at the latest in order to meet the delivery deadlines guaranteed to customers for the ordered goods. The employees use handheld scanners to document each of their work steps. The data collected in real time is stored by Amazon and analyzed by using a software called Fulfillment Center Labor Management. This software is a web-based application for resource and performance management within the logistics center. The software contains functions that enable the recording and evaluation of team performance as well as individual employee performance on the various process paths of the logistics center. In summary, this is current and minute-by-minute -minute quantity and 
quality data on employees, which is collected continuously, that's important, continuously and used to create performance po profiles and for feedback discussions and process analysis. Amazon stated the following with regard to data processing purposes. Current and minute by minute individual employee performance values would be required for the control of logistics processes in order to be able to react to performance fluctuations due to the shifting of employees in different work areas. Real-time data processing can be used to evaluate live whether work is fast or slow and whether staff need to be reallocated to ensure an even distribution of work and a steady flow of goods in order to meet delivery targets. The data could also be used to locate employees without having to spend time searching for them in the logistics center. Employees receive objectives, so Amazon, employees receive objective feedback based on the performance data without being influenced by a nose factor. That was what's, what Amazon said. The data would also be taken into account in personal decisions, making them more objective. Um, the, Works Council, the Works Council also demanded this, as personal decisions are so objective. The supervisory, my authority, argued that the, the uninterrupted minute-by-minute -minute collection of performance data was unlawful. The data evaluation was suitable for achieving the purposes pursued, but permanent data collection was not necessary to achieve the purpose. We argued, among other things, that temporary and anonymized data collection was sufficient. Permanent controls lead to pressure to adapt and perform. Um, the Hannover Administrative Court ruled that the data collection is lawful and can be based on Article 88 um, in conjunction with uh, Section 26 of the German Bundesdatenschutzgesetz. So it's called like this. Um, the processing of useful data does not legitimize Processing. Rather, an employer must have a legitimate, reasonable interest worthy of protection in the use of certain data. And this interest must be so serious from an objective point of view that the interests of employees in the protection of their personal rights takes a back seat. The administrative court identified three main purposes. The management of logistics processes, the management of individual employee qualifications, and the creation of an objective assessment basis for individual feedback and personal decisions. In the court's view, data processing is necessary to protect Amazon's interests. In the opinion of the court, there are no milder means available. The supervisory authority has appealed against the decision and a decision by the um, higher administrative court in Lüneburg is still pending. Okay. That's very interesting case. We'll, be, we'll yes, continue to follow, follow that for sure. And we hope... We, we really hope that uh, the higher administrative court yeah. um, will find another interpretation of um, the, the uh, word necessary. We, call, we say in German erforderlich. Yeah, and necessary. Yeah. Yes, and uh, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. John, you're, you're representing a very different sector, IT development consulting, where you, you probably employ more very highly qualified staff. In, in your position, you're, you're spearheading the, the use of AI, AI tools in, in HR management. 
What, in your views, are, are the benefits of, of such tools, uh, not only for the company, but also, also for the workforce? Um, I think there are a number of them, but first of all, I'll just say thank you for the opportunity to come and share our kind of views and stories with the audience. The first one really is, within IBM, we tend to look at AI as augmented intelligence. So the idea there is, can it help people make better decisions about people? To do this, you've got to give the AI access to real-time data, um, and you've then got to add insights to it. One of our kind of key principles that we, we don't break is that humans must be kept in the loop. The whole idea is that people make decisions about people, not AI. I think furthermore, what we've spent a lot of time doing is educating IBMers on where you can and should use AI, but also where you should not use AI. And we publish those rules and regulations very clearly for every single IBM to see. I think the second use um, where we've seen AI make a huge difference is around creating a continuous learning culture. So go back to 2016 and every IBM has spent on average 31 hours a year learning new skills and capabilities. And with a lot of sponsorship from the top, uh, we had the ability to build a new AI solution. And this AI solution for learning helped match individuals based on their preferences, based on their roles, based on their career aspirations, to, spe to specific learning plans for them. What that did is it really kind of made learning easy. You know, our old CHRO um, called it Netflix for learning. The idea that you determined what learning came to you. And by 2022, we'd seen that the average IBM was now spending 87 hours a year learning. So we, we now know that every single person within IBM understands that upskilling and reskilling is not just something we would like them to do as an organization, but it's something that they themselves are driving. I think the kind of the third thing that we really look at is when you've created a new kind of culture, when you've created new skills and new capabilities, how do you match them to specific opportunities? And we heard a lot yesterday from the, uh, the Minister for uh, Promotion of Employment and Equality in Galicia. We also heard from the Federal Employment Agency in Germany how they're doing very similar things, both as a region and both as a, as a government and an organization. And I think one thing that came through that we, we fundamentally agree with is this idea of human-friendly automation. It's actually something that the German government, IBM, and companies like the Federal Employment Agency are working really hard to do, which is use AI for the right reasons, not for the wrong ones. Another area that we've, we're kind of working on a lot at the minute is democratization of AI. The idea for us is, can we give these AI capabilities into the hands of the people doing the work? Because our view is that it's easier to teach someone in payroll, for example, how to understand what automation and AI can do for them, than it is to teach a software developer how payroll works. And that's kind of pretty fundamental across all of our back office solutions and, and capabilities in particular. So for us, um, if we take payroll as a good example, we took all the people in the operation centers around the world for payroll and said, we're gonna give you the opportunity to go and invest in two days learning. In particular, looking at things like robotic process automation, uh, and looking at things like chatbots, and understanding the capability, the right use of those things. And we said to them, now go back and you reinvent how your work gets done. You look at opportunities for things like repetitive work, high volume work, rule-based work, and say, can you design and then implement with our developers those particular capabilities so that we can move you to higher value work? Could a chatbot take away things like FAQs? Could it do policy search? Could it do the really things that a lot of payroll people were kind of saying, I don't want to do this continuously. Can I not train a chatbot how to do it? And what we've seen is that over the last four or five years, the average band of a payroll person in IBM has gone up by a whole band. And that's because the work that they're doing is significantly higher complexity and it needs a significantly higher skills. But what's even more interesting is a lot of the payroll people came back to us and said, can I be the person who trains the chatbot? So we created chatbot content managers. They said, I'm the person that people come to for analytics insights. Could I go on a two year training course to be a data scientist? And it's really interesting that by that democratization of AI, people themselves are driving changes, not just the way they work, 
but even their whole careers. And I think kind of the final thing that we, we see is something that was talked a lot about yesterday is this idea that foundation models should be open. They should be available to everybody, not just to a small number of, of big tech companies. And putting that capability of, of open source AI and foundation models into the hands of entrepreneurs, into small businesses, that's where IBM sees really kind of not just changing IBM, but every single organization. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, John, also for this, this outlook on, on, on how AI can actually improve our working, working life. James, you, you come from the platform economy, no? and which is often seen as the harbinger of things um, still to come in the, in the broader labor market. And you're organizing and defending workers that are already today managed by algorithms. What, what would you see as the main challenges for workers uh, in, 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 in sectors where AI and algorithmic management is only beginning to be deployed? So, and w are there also any potential opportunities? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to be here and be on this panel and to listen to all these other great speakers. If you don't mind, I just want to describe the political context of, of where we've arrived to. In October 2008 was a very interesting period in time. It was the month that the Apple App Store was opened, uh, that the Google Play Store was opened, but it was also the same time that the economy crashed. Uh, we had the financial crisis. So within six months, interest rates went to zero. All the capital flew to Silicon Valley, uh, and the mobile platform took off. But it was also an age of austerity. So workers were put into this position of having to work two jobs to pay off that dodgy mortgage uh, that caused the financial crash in the first place. Um, and that was also the rise of post-truthism, populism. And we've seen this type of post-truthism uh, and populism play out in the gig economy as well. Um, so I would say some of the issues that we're dealing with immediately and have been dealing with for years with the uh, gig, so-called gig economy is a complete lack of transparency for workers, particularly around the fundamentals of how is my pay set? How is the work allocated to me? How am I being performance managed, including how am I being automatically dismissed? Um, uh, and this situation is getting worse as AI and machine learning is applied in these platforms, the gig economy. These platforms are now maturing. They're trying to find a path to profitability, so they're deploying new technology. So things like, um, uh, well, hypervariability and dynamic pricing, dynamic pay systems. So the two-sided uh, platform marketplace is one of dynamic pricing for customers, but that also turns to be dynamic pay setting for workers. And we've already seen the problems with dynamic pricing for things like Bruce Springsteen tickets and Taylor Swift tickets, but the same technology is now being applied to setting pay, if you can imagine. Uh, and we've just seen these, um, these technologies being rolled out. Uh, it'll probably be quiet for a while, but, but the screw is going to turn because this is how these companies have to make money now, is by profiling workers, profiling consumers, uh, and trying to wring out a, gre in a, a greater increase in, in margin. Uh, and we just simply have, have no um, uh, uh, transparency to that. Related to that is concealed algorithmic management uh, decision-making. There's an incentive to conceal it because the problem of worker misclassification is, is one of these things, which is like, you know, Matthias, you and I are in a relationship, right? Matthias say, no, 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 we're not in a relationship. But that's the same thing that happens with workers. You say, you contest, I'm in a relationship. Employment is a relationship like any other. But the employer says, no, there's no relationship. The burden is on you, even with the platform work directive, with all the um, debate around the presumption of employment, the burden will still remain with the worker to prove that they're in this employment relationship, to prove that there's management control. And increasingly, the game now is a game of hide the ball. Hide the ball, hide the management control. And what we try to do is to, is to reveal that management control in algorithm. And there's also the problem of decentralizing, uh, decentralizing uh, effective technology uh, that workers are trying to cope with. So uh, there isn't a traditional workplace. 
uh, work has been decentralized through platforms, uh, but also increasingly because of the effect of the pandemic. Uh, there's more hybrid working, which, which decentralizes the workforce. And, and then there's a challenge to re-centralize and collectively organize. There's problems of surveillance at work, rising surveillance, facial recognition systems not working properly. Uh, at Uber, we've had some interesting challenges. Which we've won all of them. Uh, where people have been misidentified um, uh, with the use of facial uh, misuse of facial rec recognition technology, location checking. And then finally, I'd say, just before I go on too long, we talk about human in the loop and human review. Our experience of it, that the human review has been extremely poor quality. Uh, and that's because, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here is about kind of supply-led technology, supply of what we're going to do to the workers. But the worker experience back into the company is that we see hollowed out HR functions. We see NLP chatbots instead of real humans. <laughs> you know, uh, and the absurdity of, of what happens um, when Uber doesn't, when you've got an administrative problem with your account, you try to reach out to Uber and you get a response from a chatbot. And we've had to defend a couple of people who threatened suicide just to break through the NLP chat post. <laughs> and then the licensing authority sends them off for a medical to make sure that they're really not suicidal. But uh, it's, it's a great sort of example of the absurdity of trying to deal with an NLP chatbot. Mm. Um, also in the litigation we brought to Amsterdam uh, for robo-firings where people have been uh, dismissed by, uh, by algorithm. Of course, the employer will insist there was human review, but what the courts found was the human review, quote, was nothing more than a symbolic act. It was nothing more than checking the logs of the system. The worker wasn't engaged. Nobody asked for their point of view. Nobody uh, tried to understand the problem from their perspective. Uh, and so the incentive there, I think, is, is to hollow out uh, the company on the inside, which brings us back full circle to what caused the financial crash in the first place, which was misclassification, misunderstanding of risk. And one final thing, I remember reading the briefing papers for G7 Heiligen Dam a year before the financial crash, and what the G7 were worried about was the complexity of the derivative products in the financial marketplace, and nobody understood them, not even managers understood them. Well, we're saying the same thing now in the employment relationship, in the labor relationship. When workers have a problem and they go to, for this human review, there's no human, they don't understand the problems, they don't understand why the worker was fired or given a final warning. Uh, we had one driver who was, who was fired and then faced a license review, which we appealed through the magistrate's court to the Crown Court, would you believe? So we're in the old Bailey, the most uh, austere uh, Victorian central criminal court in, in London, doing a, a licensing review of all things. And you know, Uber's head of regulation was on the stand to answer the question of why this system had fired the worker. And after 10 minutes of blah, 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 the judge stood him down and said, you're an unsatisfactory witness because you're not able to explain the basics of why this worker was flagged. And the case was adjourned, and eventually somebody had to be beamed in live uh, two weeks later from California because there was literally nobody in Britain, nobody in Europe that could explain why this worker was fired. That's up there. Very, very interesting points. Thanks a lot for this about this, you know, not even managers understanding sometimes the, the technology, but also the, the lack of a human element, no? And, and also interesting point on, on, I think, dynamic pricing and, and uh, algorithmic pay and, and so on. That this is definitely something we will have to look into. Adrian, to, to sum up this first round, I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of research on the impact of, of new technologies on, on labor rights. What, are in, what, what is it that you have identified in your research as the, as the challenges, but also the opportunities um, regarding um, data use, AI, and so on? And in which sectors are workers particularly affected now? I mean, apart from the platform economy that, that we, of course, know. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to share this research. Uh, well, the first thing, uh, I have to say is that uh, uh, the challenges of, of, and the opportunities actually are the, 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 the two faces of the same coin. I mean, because depends on the use, can be a challenge 
or can be uh, an opportunity. And give, uh, let me give, me give you a couple of examples of that. For example, for uh, the algorithmic management, you, you can use it for, uh, for improving health of the workers. For example, uh, for drive, driver's safety, uh, a system uh, can alarm a, a, a worker or a driver when they fell, fall asleep, for example. This is something that could be uh, very useful. Or even, for example, e the, today with, with monitoring of, of the heart rate and with other uh, things, the algorithm can decide if a worker is too stressed, too stressed for their mental health, which could be uh, a very good opportunity to reduce uh, this stress or problem of mental health. But also, the same uh, systems can be used, for example, if the company understands that the worker is not, not stressed enough. You know, that you can't ask them for more. For example, in, uh, in, uh, there are uh, uh, research done in that there are uh, AI systems, artificial intelligence system, that uh, they are used in hotels for cleaning, cleaning ladies, uh, which they, uh, mo the, 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 the system monitorizes how many minutes or the time that they use to clean a room. And if the cleaning rate lady is taking too long, According to the to the to the algorithm, the the smart watch will vibrate to remember that the cleaning lady is taking too too much, which this this thing is called by the doctrine by the literature as the digital wimp, because it's a constant monitoring that you are being observed in every minute of your time and uh, that you have to go faster, you know. And the thing is. More, more of the time, we don't even know how the algorithm calculates the, the optimal time for cleaning the, the, uh, the, um, the room. Sometimes it's even a, a race, because if, uh, if you just, uh, the algorithm make a, 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 an average of the time of all the workers, if some workers are running more, that make that the, the, the minimum, the optimal time, is even less every time. So that, that could be a problem. Uh, something uh, similar is happening in the logistics uh, warehouse of, the, of, the compa of companies, as we already uh, heard by, by, by Barbara. So I'm not going to repeat my, myself. So this could be very bad uh, for health. <laughs> and so, so depends on the use. Can be good, can be uh, bad. So that's why I think regulation is so important because we need to use it for good things, using opportunities and limiting the use of, uh, of the bad or, or not that so much good uh, uses. Another example could be, it could be a, a very good opportunity, for example, in the, in the uh, knowledge uh, economy, you ask me for, for, for example of, of, of sectors, I think in general, for example, for consultancy uh, now, can be used for reducing re redundant, uh, boring work. For example, uh, looking for information go is going to be, or it is very easy now, so you can use all the time not looking for information or for data, but analyzing the data, so it could be more interesting uh, jobs. But also, that can be a, a, a challenge, because what we see in the data is that the, the, uh, sometimes artificial intelligence, what it's doing is replacing, or replacing the task of the middle management or the middle qualified workers, making them that they don't need to be qualified, they can be uh, less qualified for the same job. So that means usually that they, they are going to pay less the companies are going to pay less for this job because now they don't need these skills. Mm -hmm. This is something that we already seen that, not only in, in artificial intelligence, but in the last 30 years is happening in Europe and in the uh, United States that, that the middle uh, qualified and middle remunerate or middle salaries 
are being replaced mm -hmm. to low uh, jobs, low qualified jobs with uh, poor working conditions. This is what is called by the doctrine, by the literature, the great divide, which it's a, a, a really challenging point for Europe and United States because that affects to the middle class. Mm. So if something like that exists, but if the middle class exists, which is the one uh, that differentiates us from other countries, if, if, if this progress continues, the middle class can't disappear because middle class would, could be in the future lower class because now these people in the middle uh, remunerate jobs are now taking low, no, low qualified jobs with low wages. So this is a very huge uh, challenge for us, I think. Yeah. Thanks a lot, um, Adrian, for, for, for pointing this out. We are now going to start the second round of questions, but I would encourage you um, to use the slider tools also to, to already ask questions for after, which we will then take after the second round. In the second round, I will take a slightly um, different order um, in order to, to have a bit of variation. So I'll start with John this time. So you've, we've heard a lot on, 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 on the challenges as well and lack of transparency and so on. So what, what safeguards should companies have in place before introducing AI tools also to, to, to gain the trust of, of workers? Do you have any, any examples from your experience how, how, how to do that? Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, we've been using AI in IBM for many, many years. But I think as well, we, we understand probably in the last four or five years that you have to apply ethics to AI. So back in 2018, we created an AI ethics board, and that was a group of um, legal advisors, employee relations. It was functional teams, so somebody in my team from HR is, is on the board. And every time we look at using any kind of technology, if there is an element of AI in it in a way that we've never used data and AI before, we have to make a presentation to that board to get their review, to get their approvals, but also to get their advice. Well, the first thing that that AI ethics board did is they kind of agreed some principles of trust and transparency in AI. Um, having kind of listened to James, I'm hesitant to say this, but uh, humans in the loop for us in a very meaningful way uh, is something that we have to insist on. Similarly, and this is something that ChatGPT, when it first came to market just over a year ago now, is it had brought in data sets that only went up to mid-2021. So the, a really kind of key principle of AI is it has to use accurate and up-to-date data to help people make better decisions. It cannot have old inaccurate data. So any data feeds that AI uses have to be real-time. I think the third element to it is there, are, there certainly are challenges with bias around AI. So for us, it's not just that when you build something, you test to understand and then mitigate bias, but you have to continuously retest. Um, just because something's live doesn't mean to say that it can't change, because we, we constantly do upgrades. So we kind of had those kind of three key elements of what the ethics board expected everybody to do when they were developing and using AI. Um, the next step then is really to say, how do you um, make those things actionable? Yes, they're great to have in theory, they're great principles, but how do you then apply them real time to using AI with the workforce? And what we created is um, things like ethics by design questionnaires. So every time we, we create any technology that impacts the, the employees and the workforce, we ask it a simple set of questions. And from those questions, we get a very basic AI rating. The vast majority of technology that we use from vendors, from partners that we build ourselves, does not have AI in it. It's cloud-based. Where it does have AI in it, what we then do is we basically uh, create what we call fact sheets. Um, and these fact sheets look at um, the data sets that we use. They look at the purpose of that particular piece of AI for the workforce. And again, they will tell you, here are the, the use cases you can use it for that we've approved. Here are the use cases you cannot. And certain things like recruiting, promotions, um, things like performance areas, we do not use AI with. Things like skills inference, things like matching people to particular jobs is fine. 
but you should not be using AI to rank candidates because that's a decision that a recruiter or a hiring manager should take, not AI. So it's really clear and documented. And every time any em employee within IBM uses one of these AI tools, what they usually see is a pop-up that says, this is what this tool does, this is what you should be using it for, and you can click on it to get to that fact sheet. Because for us, the fundamental principles of AI ethics is transparency. And then the second element is education. We have to educate employees all the time in how to use AI correctly. So we kind of, I think I talked before about this concept of skills within IBM as being a huge part of our continuous learning culture. Upskilling and reskilling is now just, just standard within IBM, as it should be. But I think you know, what we have to do is, is really kind of say, whenever anybody um, uses any of these technologies, we, we know they've had the chance to be educated in it, and it's 100% transparent. So for me, yes, the ethics board, yes, actionable actions around questionnaires, around the fact sheets, mm -hmm. but always going back to those two same principles. Mm -hmm. Th thanks a lot for that. Um, Adrian, I, I will go to you now. Um, We've heard from, from, from James no, about the, the, the issue of lack of transparency. I mean, how transparent can employers be or should employers be about their algorithms? I mean, I think you have some experience from Spain there as well. Please tell us about that. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the thing here is that uh, we talk a lot about transparency and actually I think transparency is a minimum required by law. I mean, if we, uh, for example, we follow the European Court of uh, Human Rights in the relevant uh, case law of Barbulescu, they say that uh, uh, to monitor workers' data, you have the first thing, you have to inform them. So then we'll see if you have legitimate uh, interest uh, to collect this data. But even if you have inter legitimate interest, the first thing is that you have to inform them uh, about which data are you collecting and for what purposes. So this is the minimum. And uh, we talk a lot of transparency probably because, not because the law do not uh, require that, but because probably mo uh, some of the companies, they are not compliant. Playing, complying with that. So, and for, of course, because with algorithms, now we have a, not, a, a big challenge because some of the, uh, inf some of the information uh, is not easy to give. Mm -hmm. Why? First, proprietary rights, of course. We have to, to deal with, uh, is the code of the algorithm something that they have to release or not? Uh, intellectual property. I, I, I think yeah. no, exactly. Intellectual, yeah, yeah intellectual property. Mm. I think not because, for example, uh, what you have to, to, to give about uh, the data protection regulation, the uh, general regulation, they say that you have to be able, as a company, to explain the logic of the algorithm. So if the algorithm is making a decision, you don't have to release the code. You have to be able to explain. But Today, what is happening is that some companies, they are not able even to explain what is happening because of the black box or other things, but it's not easy mm -hmm. to explain the, 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 the real reason because uh, we, uh, and some, of course, some companies they don't want, but usually more of the problem is that they are not. But the thing is, the law is clear in that point that they have to, uh, explain the logic of that. Actually, the, the literature, we, we call it the right to an explanation. All workers has a right to an explanation from the company. But the thing is that this, this thing is not uh, being exercised. In Spain, we realize that, that we have law, we have the, 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 the data pro protection regulation, but uh, this is not being effective enough so in Spain, two years ago, we, uh, uh, the, the, the government, with an agreement of the social partners, the relevant social partners, they make a, a new law about uh, the transparency of algorithms, but not only for individual workers, but for the council of workers. So legal representative of the unions, 
that they can ask for this. They can ask for a, a, a logical explanation of what is happening with the algorithm. So the first thing they have to say, the company have to inform the worker, workers' council about if they are using uh, an algorithm affecting workers, just affecting, so it's not because uh, uh, it's not that they are making relevant uh, decisions or they are the, uh, when the algorithm is the only one making the decision, that's not required by law, just affecting, which affect, you know, it's a very broad word. So if a, which, if, uh, a company is using an algorithm over workers or in the workplace, they have to inform the, they are using it and also the rules of the algorithms to mm. they are, the algorithm is using to make decisions. Also the parameters. The, 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 the objective is to know if they are using uh, they are discriminating because they are using parameters like ideological affiliation, union affiliation, or even gender or yeah. uh, age. So this is the thing. The first thing is that today the law is already requiring this uh, uh, this level of transparency, and I think we need to go forward with that because probably only transparency is, is the first step, but it's not enough. We need uh, consultation rights uh, for for workers council. We need even maybe bargaining of the implementation of these algorithms, which is not giving a veto, but at least I think they need to. Uh, negotiate the, the the algorithms and the effects, which I think it's quite important. Thanks, yeah. thanks a lot, Adrian. And of course, transparency in, with machine learning, where algorithms are changing, will will be a, a huge challenge. No, because as we've heard, uh, not even the the managers running the systems are, might might be aware what, what the algorithm is doing now. So this is uh, the whole subject of AI explainability, which which comes into play. And uh, James, um, Adrian was already raising issues of collective uh, representation of workers. And in a previous conversation, we, you, you, you've, you have, we, had, we have talked about this concept of worker data trusts. And I would like you to explain that concept a bit to the audience and why, why you think that such data trusts could empower workers to have more control over data, uh, their data and their working conditions. Uh, well, thank you. Well, a hundred years ago, workers stood outside factory gates uh, and were literally locked out in their early union organizing activity. And really, we're back to the future in that scenario as, as, as business operations move into the cloud. Uh, management are keen to pull the ladder up and leave the workers outside. So the idea of, of a data trust is to fill that gap, uh, is to earn back a place at the table, uh, and if we can't have that, we'll, we'll demand the data and we'll understand ourselves what's actually going on uh, in this enterprise. I mean, I think of it simplistically, it's like going to the, it's like going to the hospital, you know, you get, you get a little injection of dye and then you put, they put you in the MRI machine and see, see how you, all your organs are functioning as, as the blood is processed. Well, data is blood, uh, but the algorithm is, it, you know, what we really want to know is how is our personal data being processed? Um, by the employer. We need to understand what functions, uh, what full transparency on what management decisions are being made and we need good explanations for that. So we, we need to access our data, but data alone is not enough. We need explanations of how that data uh, was processed. Um, for me, it started a very personal thing. I was involved in the case against Uber in, in the UK, and I went to court, and, and Uber made the argument against me that I didn't deserve the minimum wage because I had a fairly relatively low, or below what they wanted in terms of acceptance rates of the work that they dispatched to me. They said, look, this guy is not accepting the work. Why should we pay him minimum wage? Um, but when I looked at the day, and it came with sheaths of, my per, of, of data about how I worked, when I worked, uh, data I didn't have access to at the time. But, but when I analyzed what, what they gave and compared it to their own management notes or their own management guidance, Uber had said that uh, they expected a driver to do 2.8 jobs per hour for a 40 to 60 hour week. And the index week in question that was being discussed in court, I worked 91 hours and I did 2.9 jobs per hour. But what Uber wanted to do was present my 
acceptance rate, but not my productivity rate. My productivity rate, I was more productive at 91 hours than they expected at 40 to 60 hours, but they still didn't want me to have minimum wage. And they took the same uh, data before parliamentary committees, the Future World of Work inquiry in the, uh, in the, in the House of Commons in, in Britain. I just thought, oh, this is completely unacceptable. We have to have access to our data uh, so we can understand what's really going on and we, we can make our own case. Uh, uh, for, for that. And so it's also in terms of organizing power. There's a lot of shame in, uh, amongst low paid workers who are being classified as independent contractors. I remember when I first started saying, look, I'm not, I, I'm not able to earn minimum wage doing this work. And a lot of colleagues would say to me, oh, you're not doing it right. You don't know how to do it. You know, Noam Chomsky said taxi drivers were the last free thinkers, you know, very independent minded people. Um, and in that isolation, there's, there's pride uh, and shame that, you know, your income is declining. But then when you start talking and you start pulling the data together, people accept, ah, oh, you too, I wasn't earning minimum wage. We, we, all, we all began to understand together that there was a, there was a problem. And I remember talking to, uh, when I onboarded at Uber, and I was talking to them about the power of data, because I had come from a tech, but I had worked for SAP, and I, and I was interested in the access to data that, uh, uh, you know, that we would be used to as knowledge workers now as a you know, frontline driver. Could we have access to data so we understood where the demand was, how to optimize our earnings? And you know what they said to me? said, so, no, but we have all that, but it's proprietary. We couldn't tell you. <laughs> so it's like, well, I'm actually the productive end of your business, and you don't want me to understand how I can optimize my earnings uh, so you can optimize yours. But that, that's what we were up against. So in putting this data together, we want to understand, well, how are people earning? How can you earn more? Are, are, um, uh, is pay on the way up? Is it on the, on the way down? Can we understand uh, the working conditions, uh, the reality of them. It can we challenge, also when we look at this data, can we challenge unfair dismissals, uh, unfair suspensions, um, uh, uh, and also can we challenge discrimination? There's no way you can begin to challenge discrimination in workplace automated decision making at this scale without having access uh, to the full data set so you, you can understand it. Now, in terms of progress, I mean, compliance is just so poor. I mean, for many years, we worked to get access to this data. And well, between us here, I can tell you, we do actually have now have a data transfer agreement with Uber. Uh, so they do provide us now with the data, they do respect the right of a data trust like Worker Info Exchange to ask for the data on behalf of the worker. And they do give it to us according to a protocol we've agreed with them. So, you know, hats off to them. They're finally doing um, uh, the, the right thing. But in the courts, interestingly, both Uber and Ola, be pre prior to this, argued that uh, it was an abuse of the GDPR rights for the likes of Worker Info Exchange or trade unions to uh, get workers to collectivize their data. So that was an abuse of the GDPR. And the Court of Appeal in Amsterdam said something very interesting. He said, actually, rather than being abusive of, of the GDPR uh, uh, and data subject rights, it's the point of this. Uh, and harken back to Article 7, the European Charter. He said, this is the point of data trusts and this collective work is to strengthen the data subjects' control over their own personal mm -hmm. data. So it was actually the opposite to what they were arguing. It wasn't a disruptive abuse. It was the whole point of strengthening data subjects. So you can strengthen your own control over your data by having the assistance of a collective. Uh, so it, it's, it's extremely important. Um, but James, James, please, I'll stop there. But besides yeah. Uber, I have to say compliance is very important. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, thanks a lot. I Sorry. think a very, very interesting point. Before I ask the last question to Barbara, before, and then we'll open up to the questions, but could I ask the technical team to put the questions we get um, on the screen here so we can see them as well, please? Um, Barbara, um, uh, data protection law and labor law have often been seen as, as separate things, but in, as, a, as we heard now, is that in workers, representatives, and courts are increasingly using GDPR to deal with labor issues. So what, how do you see the role of GDPR and data protection authorities in tackling it, challenges of workers who are facing you know, AI-driven monitoring, <laughs> management practices, and so on? Um. 
the um, data protection supervisory authorities are enforcement authorities. What they do is um, to apply applicable law. And uh, that's what I can say. We need law to, to act in the right way. Um, we have in Germany only one single provision, this uh, section 26, only one single provision. And that's really, uh, it's law uh, from another time, I would say. Um, after all, the increasing use of new technologies is advancing rapidly, especially in the world, world of work. So we heard it before. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure that the current regulations on employee data protection are in a great need of interpretation. And in addition, many aspects um, are only regulated in very general terms <clears throat> and are mainly specified by case law. And uh, that's not enough to act as an as authority. Um, so, in the, 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 the authorities of Germany, the data protection supervisory authorities, they adopted a resolution in April 2022 20, uh, entitled The Time for an Employee Data Protection Act has now been passed. Uh, it's really urgent that we get a data protection law for employees, so then the authorities can act in the way we want to act. Um, the supervisory authorities once again call on the federal legislator to enact an employee data protection act, especially against the backdrop of increasing um, digitalization. That's a very difficult word for me, <laughs> especially in the age uh, of digitalization. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's, I, it's really, yeah, yeah. really <laughs> difficult. The resolution states an employee data protection law must be sufficiently flexible, guarantee a high level of data protection, and provide legal clarity for all players in the world of work. In this resolution, we identified uh, the issues that it considers to be in need of regulation, including the use of artificial intelligence. That's what we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all what the authorities can do. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't have the law, we, we don't have any possibilities to act mm -hmm. against um, against surveillance, what you said before. And uh, we, can applying, uh, we can apply and we can interpret the applicable law and uh, we can hope that German lawmakers will pass regulations that take account of advancing, um, take account of the growing importance of employee data protection. So that's all what I can say. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Maybe in the final round we can talk a bit uh, the, the plans yeah. in, in mm -hmm. Germany. Um, Yasmin, um, you've been looking at the questions coming from the audience. Uh, what what uh, have you found there? As interesting questions. Yes. Let me start actually with the top question, which says, um, "Do you see specific challenges of AI and data collection in a remote working environment that would need to be addressed through targeted measures?" So this is linked to the question of, of, of telework and working from home, um, where, of course, there might be other ways of monitoring. I don't know who, who would like to answer to that. Um, anyone feeling? Adrian, do you want to say a few words on that, maybe? Of course. Uh, I mean, the thing about uh, remote work is that uh, there, there's been not enough trust and Today, at least, probably in the future, it would be different, but today, usually, supervisors, they do not know very well how to lead. The, the research says that they don't know how to lead 
uh, or, or control uh, uh, remote workers. So uh, that, that make that they focus in this uh, spy software or monitoring software of uh, every uh, step of the way of the workers at the remote work. For example, uh, these softwares today, they count the each, uh, each of one types of the, of the keyboard, or even they, they, uh, they count the, the movement of the, of the mouse, uh, the number of emails sent, uh, how many time do you spend in front of the, of the screen, and all this, this data is uh, processed by the algorithm, and they make usually a productivity index. So this is the same thing that we talk uh, uh, today for a warehouse or for the cleaning ladies. With all this data, you can be used for, uh, for uh, calculate the, the, the productivity optimal, but in different ways, in the benefit of the workers, in the benefit of the uh, company. And uh, the thing is that uh, in the, I think that this is probably uh, not necessary, but the court will say about that, about this, all this monitoring is necessary or not. And the thing is, as in the office, you have other ways of controlling or monitoring workers, probably court, the court will say that this level of monitoring is too much. But in remote work, without other ways, probably the court will say that this could be necessary. And this means that with, monitor, with, with remote workers, probably the court will allow a higher level of processing data, which could be okay for us, or maybe as a society, we have to say that we need to change these parameters necessary. Maybe it's not the, a good way to define the, the level of the uh, fundamental uh, rights for workers. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Uh, Yasmin, what's, what's the next question? Yes, shall we take another one? So um, there's one that is specifically addressed to, to John, it seems, which seems uh, says, does regulation laws on workers make your work at IBM more difficult? <laughs> <laughs> um, not in the slightest. For us, complying with legislation and laws is it's a, it's non-negotiable. We have to do it. Um, I think what's interesting about it is we employ 280,000 people around 85 countries. I in the job that I do around the technology, data and AI, I've got to know a lot of lawyers in the last kind of few months and years because they're the people that work with the legislators to give us a heads up, say, this is coming, how can we be ready for it? This is now law, how do we understand it and interpret it in the right way? And then make sure that that's built into all of our technologies. I think what's interesting is we, it's all into partnerships. So we have a lot of vendors that we use um, and we have to work with them to understand for cloud technologies, are you building these legislations into your technology? How can we be confident that you're doing it in the right way and in a timely way? Where we build our own technologies, we ourselves have to make sure that we are compliant with all the different rules and regulations. To me, I think GDPR is a really good thing because I own my data and my company should make sure that I can see it and, and understand it and be able to kind of make sure that it's being held in the right way, secure and private, and used for the right mechanism. So, for a very personal level, I think it's, it's something that, that is a really positive thing. Um, the key thing is to make sure that whatever laws are put in place are things that technologies and organizations can use, and use in the right way, meaningful way. So, the straight answer is no, I think it's great. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yes, um, one more. Um, in, U in the US, AB 701 in California gives workers the right to access data gathered. As a practical matter, they lack resources to evaluate fairness slash lawfulness. What to do? James, maybe that's a question for you. Um, the, the practical, you know, once you get the data, can, can you, what, what, you know, what do you need to be able to assess them and to, to, to make them useful for you? 
Well, actually, I don't think that's really the difficult bit, if I, if I may say so. I, I think what's required first, though, is a standard, uh, a, a standard of, uh, of, of disclosure. Uh, if you, and platforms already do this uh, voluntarily with many cities, like New York City um, has this agreement, I think San Francisco has this agreement, um, where the data is provided standards so they, they, can, they can understand what the movement is, what the, uh, what the pay is in New York, in fact. Um, and uh, workers and trade unions need to have a similar sort of, I hope, voluntary agreement eventually, or, or, or a regulated one, um, because without that, uh, what these companies will do is just throw chaff at you. Uh, and it's very unstructured, it's very hard to, 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 um, to put that together. Because they're changing, they're changing how they process the data, so there's no consistency. So there's a lot of treatment of the data that needs to go on before you can actually um, uh, start to use it. So the one thing I would call out for is, is the need for uh, standards in, in how the data is released. Mm -hmm. Very interesting point. Yasmin, what else do we have? Yes, um, what can be done about data from yet-to-be employees uh, i.e. data harvested through uh, during hiring processes. I don't know, Barbara, is that a question for you? Um, you know, once, you know, it, I, I guess this refers to the recruitment process and, and, and companies already collect data during the recruitment process. What, what can they do with this data? I mean, legally from a GDPR angle. I think you need the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> All the techniques, technical stuff here. Um, um, I think that, um, as you said, the GDPR is a good thing, but uh, for employees, it's not enough. And um, so we think in Germany about... Um, a special law for this um, this uh, process to um, to how to how to say to um, um, for for the application process. So that's what I would wanted to say. Um, if we don't have that um, that law special law for this application process, we um, we can interpret um, what uh, what. Uh, right now, we, we, uh, we, the rules we have, but um, I would like to say what we think about in Germany, and uh, I think that's um, necessary because this question um, means something uh, what we wanted to create, but we didn't create it still till now. Um, we see a particular need for protection in the ap application process. It should be clearly and reliably stipulated with which questions are inadmissible in job interviews and under which conditions which tests and examinations may be carried out. Only what is actually necessary do to determine the suitability of applicants can be permitted. The tests and examinations used must therefore comply with recognized quality standards. Information on the suitability and qualifications Wait a moment. Applicants must always be obtained directly from the applicant. Medical examinations should only be permitted if they are necessary for the performance of a job or required by law. Um, for example, for pilots, uh, there is a, it, it is necessary. Um, employers may only be informed of the necessary results with regard to suitability for the job according to the criteria of suitable or not suitable. Medical findings may not be passed on, uh, passed on to the employer. Mm. So these are the points we are thinking about, but um, it, maybe it will come. Mm. We don't know if it uh, really 
uh, will um, be law that uh, will be will be passed. Mm, okay, maybe let's take one one last question because I think that brings us an interesting point that you've just raised: this tension between data protection on the one hand and maybe protecting health and safety and on the other. Um, because you know you might need the data to to protect health and safety, but that might be very sensitive data. I don't know, um, Adrian. Do you, do you want to? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think this this is the key, and this is very very difficult uh, issue. It's a very good question because uh, today I think this is how can we use this data only for the purposes. This is the thing. Uh, it's not easy because if the company receives this, this information, uh, maybe they are using it not only for health issues, but for other purposes. So uh, one of the options uh, is that a third company is the one evaluating the health of the workers with this data, and they should have it forbidden to give it to the, the, the employer. You know, this is one thing. But this can be challenging if the company or the employer is paying the third party. Because it's like uh, we, we saw it in the past, for example, for, for accountability audits, for example, with Elron or these big issues, when, when, when the third party is paid by the, the company, they have incentive to cheat to give the information, even for medical information, that happened. There are resolution all over all over the uh, the Europe that when there are a, a medical third company uh, controlling, not with with AI, not with artificial intelligence, but with with medical records, normal medical records, there are usually a, a leaks of information to the the, the main com main com the employer. So we need to. To uh, to check and make the the, the 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 correct incentive for this third party that they cannot uh, link this information to the employer. Yeah, very very important point. Well, I think we are approaching uh, lunchtime, so should we should slowly wrap up. Thanks a lot for the questions from the audience and for for Yasmin for helping with this. Um, I will ask now a, a final question to all of the four panelists. Um, and Barbara, I will again start with you. Um, you've already explained you know, why you think there's a need for a new um, data protection law. Can you maybe give a few more examples of why you think um, this is needed? Um, so, um, as I said before, in Germany we think about this special law for employees. And uh, under the joint leadership of the Federal Ministry of the Interior and the Federal Ministry of Labor, meanwhile, there had been developed 12 key points for a legal regulation and discussed with the outside world in a stakeholder dialogue in April of this year. Um, I can't tell everything about 12 points, and as I know now, <laughs> Um, as I know now, maybe two or three points uh, won't be discussed anymore, but there are very important points, I think. So one of the key points calls for transparency in the use of artificial intelligence. That's what we were talking about all the time. It goes on to say we want to provide regulations for typical data processing operations in the employment context that are based on artificial intelligence or algorithms, especially um, the current developments towards the creation of an EU legal um, AI framework should be taken into account. That's what we want to do, but we are waiting for the framework and it's not sure if this framework really will come. Um, the key points also call for the limits of surveillance and monitoring to be regulated by law. Permanent surveillance measures should only be permitted in exceptional cases under strict conditions. Employers should not be allowed to create complete movement and performance profiles to evalu evaluate employees. 
um, covered surveillance profiles, covered surveillance measures uh, by the employer should only be permitted if there is no other way to clarify the specific suspicion of a criminal offense in the company. With regard to overt surveillance measures such as targeted, targeted video surveillance or locating employees, clear conditions, conditions should ensure in particular that employees have places and times to retreat without being observed. Mm -hmm. So um, these are, I think, very important key points um, and the application yeah. <laughs> process is yeah. another key point. Yeah, we talked and, about And uh, I shouldn't talk, talk much more mm -hmm. because of the time. Yeah, we, we, we're running out. But thanks for pointing these important priorities out. And we'll, we'll be watching what happens in, in Germany with, a, yes. with this legislation. <laughs> <laughs> John, you already said you're not afraid of, of rules. Um, but f uh, maybe from a company's perspective, what, what would you need from governments and lawmakers to help you successfully use and implement AI tools that are also in, in the interest of, of the workforce? Um, I think, first of all, it, there's a huge amount of sympathy that, that we have for lawmakers uh, around AI. You know, the pace at which things are changing, the complexity of some of these, it's not a job I would want, to put it mildly. Um, I think for us, it comes back to kind of three key things, and we've talked about them a lot this, after, or this morning. AI must be explainable. Um, it has to be trustworthy, and it has to have a very clear governance model in place. I think we have to ensure that individual organizations who use AI are accountable for that use. And I think um, the frameworks that we're seeing today from the EU, from the US, I think are trying to balance that how do we regulate risks, and I think we should be specifically targeting the use of AI in those kind of use cases with enabling innovation and absolutely openness of the foundation models. I think we should also look, and, and something I've really enjoyed about the last two days is I've seen you know, the EU in this conference reach out to engage with employees. You know, employees should have a say and, and a real engagement around things like being educated on what AI can do for them and how it works. We have a lot of user groups um, that whenever we develop something, they're the ones that work with us to say, how does this work for you? You know, give us the feedback constantly. And I think we also have to look at the kind of the regulation bodies themselves in saying there's a lot of conversation about should institutions create individual AI kind of regulatory boards, or should we educate the existing regulation authorities so that I think it's easier to look at someone like the, the Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion um, Commission within the EU and get them to understand AI and how it's deployed for employees, rather than have one body that goes across all industries. So I think making sure that we, we keep that education we keep the transparency are probably fundamental to how I think you know the legal side should go. Thanks, thanks a lot for that, John. Um, James, in, in your view, from from more the the workers' perspective, what what concretely is is needed to to make all this what we've been discussing about transparency, control of data, control and the use of um, technology, um, a, a reality. Um, well, I'll try to be brief and say it's three C's that need, we need attention to, the consent, compliance, and cooperation. Um, the concept of consent in work has been stretched to just breaking point. Um, that is just the example of, of actually how consent has been turned on its head, is Uber now sort of inviting workers to register their use of CCTV with the platform, under the understanding that if there's a complaint, if you want to, you can give the CCTV footage um, to Uber. But you know, you're, in, you're in no position not to give it to them because your job is going to depend upon it. But of course, consensually, you're, you're, you're giving it to them. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and the only lawful basis for you to really do that would be legitimate interest. But even that you can't do 
a proper balancing test on in this situation because you, although you're a data controller, you're in control of nothing. So the whole consent concept needs a lot of reworking in the context of employment and work. Compliance, there just isn't, there just isn't any, there just isn't any in terms of data protection within the workforce. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, it, just, it just, with a lot of experience of it over the years in terms of employment law and data protection, it just compliance is not there and enforcement isn't there either. So a lot of this becomes very academic. We have a situation with Uber with the robo firings. We won at the Court of Appeal. They were obliged to give an algorithmic explanation of the robo firing. Um, they gave one, it was not adequate, they went to court to get a, a declaration that it was, they lost. Uh, time has run out to appeal even that. Um, they've run up a penalties bill of 750,000 euros now. Uh, so there's no compliance, um, there's no payment, uh, there's no enforcement uh, on that. So uh, compliance is awfully important. Uh, and finally, just in terms of cooperation, what we've seen too much of, and maybe, maybe I'm guilty of this, is, is the greedy side of AI, the controlling Taylor-esque side of artificial intelligence. Uh, I'd, I'd just love to see more positive examples of how it could enrich the workplace, how it could give more control and cooperation and, and richness at work. But unfortunately, some of the examples I've seen so far are, are a bit of exploitative and controlling and greedy and return to a very Taylor-esque world. Uh, maybe we, I think we can do better than that because, because of course, I, I believe in technology, believe in technology for good, but it's all about the incentives. Who has the incentive uh, and who has the control? Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, um, James. Adrian, you'll, you'll have the last word. I mean, we've, we've talked about, um, you know, legislation in place, what do we need? If there's one thing that you would ask policy makers to, to focus in, what, what would it be? Wow. Well, uh, the first thing, uh, I think that we need to apply the rules that already have. Because compliance, as you said, it's, 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 it's the key issue. The last uh, probably five years, uh, the legislator made uh, very complex rules that, uh, with a lot of exemptions, which today they make them ineffective. For example, well, we already uh, seen about the concept of necessity. You can use data protection if it is necessary. Okay, but what necessary means? Probably uh, this is a very, very vague that makes it very difficult for enforcers to enforce that. Because, of course, companies are going to say, yeah, of course, I needed that. I need to recollect all because it's cheaper to monitor without with ILO that with uh, uh, artificial intelligence that uh, make it with another, another ways of monitoring workers. So the first thing is uh, compliance. Uh, we need to change that and apply these laws. And uh, the other thing which I ask, uh, uh, we, I will ask for, for two things if you allow me very quickly. The first is about consent. Okay, uh, data protection rules, uh, they uh, focus a lot of on consent, but labor law, from the beginning of the history of labor law, they don't trust consent of workers because usually there is not a real consent. So why we don't change the individual consent for collective consent? This is the only thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. Just trust with labor representative to give consent, not individual consent, which is what we have, but collective consent. This change will make the whole difference and is what labor law have been done from the beginning of the, the, the century. And the other thing that we probably need is uh, uh, a public auditing of the algorithms. Not for all algorithms, of course, but when we have a discrimination case, for example, for gender or, 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 or political uh, discrimination, probably we need uh, intervention of public auditing for, for make sure if that is true or not. Because courts are not ready today to, to deal with that without uh, help of the public administration. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Adrian. And with that, I think we can conclude our panel. We hope we've given you some food for thought. Um, I hope it was a small step in the reflection process, uh, a reflection process on what is needed to ensure that data and AI um, are used in work processes in a way that we make the best use of it. 
and guard against possible risks to working conditions and personal data. I would to give a, like to give a huge thanks to our fantastic um, panelists for this very interesting point. <laughs> thanks also to Yasmin for organizing this uh, together with me, to the interpreters, to the technicians, to the organizers, and to the audience for the active participations and the, the questions we got. There will be lunch in the Riverside area and we'll ask you to leave your headsets in this room, please. Thank you very much.